You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 123. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Diets keep their promises in the sense that they might say, do you lose 10 pounds in 21 days if you do what we tell you to do? And there's a good chance you'll do that. You'll pay a little bit better attention to food. You're just doing exactly what they tell you, the recipes and the shopping list and the whole thing. But on day 22, you've done no mental prep to say, well, has this, have I incorporated this as a habit? Is this who I am? I've been sort of pretending and trying this out. Hey, 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 veggie lovers. Welcome back to Veggie Doctor Radio and happy Sunday. I have another really fun episode of Veggie Doctor Radio for you today with Sid Garza Hillman. He actually has his own coaching program and has been in this space for a while. And we talk about habits and behaviors and some really cool stuff. So I hope that you are sitting back and relaxing, or maybe you're on your walk or exercising while you're listening to this, which would be even better. But before I tell you about Sid, I want to let you know that I do have lots of free resources available at dryami.com forward slash free. That is D-O-C-T-O-R-Y-A mi.com forward slash free. So if you're wondering, how do I start swapping out meat in my life? How can I get off of dairy? I really want to, but I don't know where to start. What am I going to eat? I have lots of great PDF downloads, meat replacement, dairy replacement, eating out guide, teaching you how to make choices at restaurants, even at fast food restaurants zero waste swaps for you minimalists and earth friendly people out there and a plant based shopping list and more. So go to dryami.com forward slash free to check out those free resources. In addition, if you'd like to support the show, there are a couple of ways you can do that. You can check out my affiliate store and go shopping for things that you may already be in the market for. So go see if there's something that you're wanting. And when you purchase it, I get a small percentage of that and it helps to grow the show, keep consistent quality, improve it, and ensure that we will be here for you week after week. You can also become a patron. That is a great way to support the show. Go to patreon.com forward slash the Dr. Yami. There's lots of levels with perks. So consider doing that. Thank you so much for being a loyal supporter. And thank you to all of you who have read my book, A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy. It's available on paperback, ebook, and audiobook at all the major booksellers. If you've read it, please let me know what you think. Better yet, write a review on Amazon. I would really appreciate it. Remember that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. So if you have concerns about you or your child's eating, nutrition, or growth, consult a doctor. Sid Garza Hillman is the author of Approaching the Natural, a Health Manifesto, and the book called Raising Healthy Parents, Small Steps, Less Stress, and a Thriving Family. He holds a BA in philosophy from UCLA, is a public speaker, podcaster, and his podcast is called What Sid Thinks, certified nutritionist and running coach, and the founder of smallsteppers.com. He is the Stanford Inn and Resorts Wellness Programs Director and Race Director of the Mendocino Coast 50K Trail Ultra Marathon. That's intense. We talk about that towards the end of the episode, but wow, what a cool event. 
So you can find Sid at SidGarzaHillman.com altogether or the website SmallSteppers.com. He also has a YouTube channel under Sid Garza Hillman. So in this episode, we talk about his plant-based journey, which is really interesting how he actually stumbled upon plant-based nutrition. And he talks about what happened the few years before he transitioned to fully plant-based, how him and his wife approached it is a really funny story. So I hope you enjoy that. But we also talk about how he parents his plant-based children and some of the things that they've experienced while raising their three plant-based kids and what he thinks that most people struggle with when it comes to habit and behavior change and what he thinks is a better approach than what most people try to do. We also talk a lot about the time he's had off of social media. It's been two years now that he has not had any social media and how that has impacted him and also some of the pros and cons of social media. So I think that you're really gonna like this episode. It's a little bit of a different take on things, but I know that you will probably resonate with a lot of the things that we said. So without further ado, let's listen to the conversation between me and Sid Garza Hillman. Well, Sid Garza Hillman, thank you so much for joining me on Veggie Doctor Radio today. I couldn't be happier to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, it's always so fun to have another podcaster on the show because I know it's going to sound amazing (laughs) and it's going to go smoothly and we're going to have a really fun time. But I want to dig into your history. Tell me about your plant-based journey. How did you get here? Um, in a weird way, I was um, a full, I always joke, my major in, in college at UCLA prepared me for what I was trying to do after college, which was to be an indie rock musician. <laughs> um, and so I was playing gigs at night, um, but had been a lifelong asthmatic and, you know, the, carrying the inhaler, the whole thing. And just by chance, I was handed a book by a friend uh, called Fit for Life. And, and I read it and it's made a correlation, if not basically Caus- causal relationship between dairy and asthma. And I went, that's weird. You know, everybody needs dairy. Like that's insane. But I thought, well, I'll just give up dairy for like, just to see within a month, my asthma was gone. And I, you know, first time in 23 years at that point, um, literally that fast. And so even though I kept playing music and then got into acting, I was still reading nutrition book after nutrition book. Cause it was so, so fascinating to me that that little change. And I was off all medication just almost overnight, you know, like it was within a month. And so I'm running, I'm going for, you know, I was a recreational runner at the time, two, three miles, no inhaler, you know, just like I used to have to carry it with me, like the whole thing. And so it was really cool. So I just kept going. And the more I read, uh, the more I realized. And so I would sort of dabble in 100% plant-based. And then my wife and I, <laughs> I got married and my wife and I would take a, this is a true story, we would take an allergy pill every Friday night before we would go out to get Mexican food because he knew that we were both, because she has like horrible allergies to dairy too you know, allergies and stuff. We take an allergy pill and finally it was just like, what are we, this is crazy. If I have to take medication in order to to eat something, maybe it's not good for you. So in 2002, we just both were like, we're done. We're done. It's so much easier to just go hundred percent. Don't have to think about it. It's fun and enjoyable. We feel so much better and we're good. And so ever since 2002, we've been hundred percent plant-based and our three kids are since birth. Wow. That is such a cool story. No, but I love how you're talking about taking an allergy pill because That's kind of the American way, right? Like if you watch TV and you look at the ads, they're always showing people eating like, you know, greasy tacos and pizza and stuff and having heartburn. And the strategy in the commercial isn't eat healthier. It's take an antacid, right? Like that's just how we do it here in America. Yeah, we want we we want no consequences for our actions. And, And it's, you know, it's almost becoming worldwide, too. And it's like. People have to understand, though, it's not it. There are there are side effects to those medications, as you know, better than anybody. Mm -hmm. And so it's never it's not, you know, it's not like I would take that allergy pill and eat that Mexican food with dairy in it and feel great. I just wouldn't have asthma, but I still felt weird in the morning, like, (laughs) you know, because there's side effects to medications when you're on. It's better to not be on medication than any doctor who tells you differently doesn't have your best interest. You know, it's ideally not to be on it. Sometimes you have to be, but it's ideal not to be. So for me, it was a simple, I was able to get off it. So why not? You know, it was such a better, better picture for me. Yeah. But like you were saying at the beginning of your journey, you had no clue that a food that was, you know, quote, 
like the ideal food, right? Like dairy is been touted as this miracle health food. We all need it in order to grow tall, in order to grow strong. And you were like, wait a second, this could be hurting me. I mean, yeah. so I think a lot of people are there too. Like, no, this is a health food. It can't be bad for me. So, you know, starting there, I think is really important to let listeners know that, you know, there's some things that we grow up believing that have been taught to us that aren't necessarily the true way. So I'm glad you were able to discover that. Did you feel like a big change in your singing? Because as a singer, you have to use your voice and your breath. Did it make a difference there as well? Well, yeah, and I should have mentioned, I mean, that was the reason I mentioned that I was singing because it did make a difference. And, and so when I, you know, I, when I give talks, one of my talks I give is perceptions of restriction in, in the plant base. And it's like, okay, if you look at food, yeah, I restricted my diet. I stopped eating dairy. So that's a technically a restriction in diet. But if you look at the quality of my whole life, it went way up. I mean, yeah. singing got better, running got better, feeling better in my life. And so making a choice to restrict one little area a little bit to make my whole life better was a no brainer for me. And I think for people, maybe the struggle with diet is that they're just looking at food and they're like, well, I don't want to give up. I don't want to give up anything, but you get so much more back. And I think that it's, you know, it's, it takes a little bit of thinking, you know, but if you can connect a better quality of life to a decision that you make in that one area, it's, it's great. It, it does feel better. There are big payoffs. Yeah. So that's so beautiful. Well, is that what inspired you to become a nutritionist or how did that happen? Yeah, totally. So, so, so then cut, cut to, I'm still playing and my band got never big, but big enough to tour around Europe and Canada and us. So we're doing that and I'm starting to make a living acting. And so I'm doing the, you know, we're living in LA, my wife's a graphic designer and we're just kind of doing our thing. And then we had a child and, but slowly the business of acting and music, I started to get very burnt out on. And so I was looking to get out of LA essentially. Like we'd at that point been there 20 years and my wife works in a, at a home studio. So she's a more mobile. It was just more of me saying, look, like, am I really to give up this career, which is pretty great if you think about it, but, it, but it was just kind of eating me away. So we just escaped out of LA with almost no plan. We, we moved up to this little town called Mendocino on the California coast where we still live. And honestly, I didn't really have a plan. I was managing a restaurant but because I had been reading, I just kept talking. It was at a plant-based resort where I still work around the wellness center there, the only plant-based resort in North America. And so I'm working there and I'm talking to people about nutrition because I'm pretty well versed at this point, right? But I don't have like creds. I don't have cred. You know, like I'm talking, but they're like, you're a manager of a restaurant. Like, what do you know? So I talked to the owners. I was like, listen, I kind of want to go back to school. I've been passionate about this. I've been reading by that time, probably 50 books on nutrition. And, and can I, what do you think? what happens? Can you, can I teach her? They said, sure, you can teach, you can, you know, help direct the wellness center. So I went back to school and became a certified nutritionist. It was like, I told my wife, I was like, I, I love this subject. Like I love it. I've been talking about it for 20 years. Why don't I put, you know, finally put some muscle into it. And so, um, and that, so that's what, that's what happened. It was kind of a weird chain of events, but it was something I was passionate about and still am. That's so cool. Well, you took a really very sharp turn in your yeah. career there, <laughs> going from like <laughs> Indie rock music. singing to nutritionist. I look back and I'm like, what was I thinking? It was so weird. You know, it was like such, it was totally was, it was like a complete left turn and I can't explain it other than it was something that I was, it, I was passionate about that I know. And, um, recently went back to school and became a, a certified running coach because I've been running for years and, and direct an ultra marathon. And it was something I was passionate. I'm like, you know what? I'm and small steppers. Like I'm, I want to be doing, and so do you, you know, like it's, it's fun to not just fun. It's fulfilling to be part of something that makes a, not just a job. I'll put it that way. And I like being that example for my kids, like find something you're passionate about, whatever that is. I don't care. Just find something and get and lock into it as much as you can. I love that. Well, speaking of kids, tell me about parenting. So, you know, you have your own journey. You discovered the dairy thing, opened up your whole world. You become a nutritionist and you have kids. How has being a parent changed your approach to nutrition? What have you learned along the way? Um, I mean, I'd like to say I learned a ton. I, nutritionally speaking, nothing. I mean, I knew enough about nutrition that it was... Um, I wrote a whole book on the subject called Raising Healthy Parents because this is really a parenting issue more than it is about my kids. It's about me being strong enough and my wife being strong enough as, as parents to say we know what's we we believe this what is what is best. And mm -hmm. and so knowing what I know, people often say like, oh, your kids are plant based. I bet you have to be really careful. And my ex my response to them is I do I have to be really careful, just not as careful as parents who feed their kids meat and dairy. 
Um, and so we do have to be careful. It's a weird world where even plant-based is can be severely unhealthy, as you know, Oreos and French fries and Coke. So, you know, you have to be careful, but I just know too much that in good conscience, I can't give my kids dairy. I can't do it. I, I it would be like, I just know too much, you know? And so it's, so then the strength part comes in where we're raising our kids this way and in a world that is squarely not plant-based and thinks it's risky when it's less risky. And then our, the MDs that we're taking our kids to for physicals are telling us every single time, you better feed your kids dairy. Where's your, where are you getting protein? You better feed your, feed your kids dairy. Where are you getting your protein? So we're, and then, you know, in uncles, you know, everybody comes out of the woodwork to tell you how risky and I'm going, yeah, but I've read the stuff. This is less risky. Like I'm doing this so I don't have to worry about it so much. Like that is the reason my wife and I feed our kids this way. So we don't have to think about it so much. Um, our kids don't have any health problems. They don't have any allergies. I grew up with allergies. I was strep throat and ear infections and allergy injections for a while. And of course the inhalers and, and it's, my kids don't have any of that. So it's, it's, um, I won't, I don't want to say it's easy, you know, and I've never lied about them. Very transparent when I give talks. I'm, this is not easy. Um, it'd be much easier for my kids to just eat what everybody else eats, except for that I know better and it's not good for them. And that's the hitch there. So that's why we do what we do. Yeah. What do you think the hardest part about feeding them is? Uh, the, just, you know, my teenager, she's 16 now, but when she was 12, she was harassed at school by a teacher's aide for being, for being vegan, you know, pointed out in mm -hmm. classes, if you're not self-conscious already at 12, you know, oh, look at mm -hmm. the vegan freak, um, you know, kids throwing chicken, you know, it, not all the time, just once in a while, you know, and look, kids get bullied for a whole bunch yeah. of reasons. So this was yeah. just that reason. Um, but in just comments, you know, and, and again, like I've been doing this a while, my wife and I has like, we, we don't, it doesn't bother us anymore, but it was in the beginning, like, geez, you know, can you save, save it, not asking for your opinion. So that's, I think the hardest part nutritionally, nothing like it's, we eat almost entirely whole plants. They eat some refined stuff as treats and it works right. You know, that's like nothing. That's like the easiest part. And, and, uh, but it's the social stuff that get, that got a little bit difficult. We found our way and now we we're, we're kind of okay with it. Wow. Yeah. I've heard about families encountering that. I think we've been lucky because my kids have not encountered that. So <laughs> thankfully, because I think that's hard for parents to hear their kids getting bullied about things like that. Um, and you said that all three of your kids have been raised vegan plant-based from birth. Do you feel that because of that, they accepted it pretty easily? Like they eat the food just like normal or yeah. have you gone through picky periods or anything like that? No, I mean, I have to, I have to be clear because, because the joke, of course, but anyway, they did where they were breastfed. So that's technically mm -hmm. not plant-based because have you ever heard people go, what about breast milk? I'm like, oh my you gosh, got yes, me. You got that, me. that you like well feed really gets on my nerves. Yeah, yeah, so good, so good, so good. <laughs> you might as well feed them Big Macs now because you got me. Cat's out of the bag. Um, anyway. And so, um, no, the, I will say, and this is a weird thing happening because there's a new generation of kids who didn't transition who started mm -hmm. this way. And my, yeah. you know, I have a 16 year old and I have 11 year old twins. Now I will say that my 11 year old twins have had almost minimal and like no trouble, like a few mm -hmm. little comments, you know, kids who go vegan is bad for, you know, like it's just like nothing, not, not like my 16 year old. She got it worse. And now she's fine. She has, she's in junior in high school and has no, none of these issues, even when she was actually physically going to school. Um, but anyways, uh, so it's, it's been, um, for them, th they're aware that other people eat these things. They don't question it at home. They, you know, I don't ever talk to them about negative stuff in terms of like the animal cruelty, let's say. Like I've never shown them. I like, we, we already eat this way. Like we're not touching that. There's just no, we're, we act on it. It's done. But in general, if it comes up, it's like, well, guys, we eat this way because we feel really good. And it's better for the environment and we, we love animals. And so it's, it's like no big deal. Some people don't, they're not there yet. And I, and we kind of just skate over it. It's not a big deal. It's just sort of one of our ethical values. My wife and I, like we don't steal, we don't cheat, we don't hurt animals. We don't damage the environment and we are nice to people. Like it's just sort of a thing, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't want to make it, oh my gosh, it's food. It's a big deal. It's not, it's just sweet food and not all the time healthy, frankly, yeah. you know, and, and I'm clear on that with people like my kids eat junk food sometimes like. Other kids do. It just happens to be plant-based. It mm -hmm. doesn't make it better for you healthy-wise. It makes it maybe a little bit better for the environment. <laughs> I don't know. But anyways, that's yeah. kind of where we're at on that.
That's cool. Yeah, I love that. And you're right. There is a new generation of kids that are starting from the beginning. And I, I do think that the earlier you start, the easier it can be, but it's never too late. You know, like some parents worry when their children are older, if they're going to accept it, you know, there's different strategies, but it's never too late to start eating more whole plant foods and integrating it into your family. So that's cool to hear your story. Well, let's talk about, you know, coaching and, and, and talking to people in general. When it comes to habit and behavior change, why do you think people struggle and what do you think people struggle with the most when they're trying to change their lifestyle? I think people struggle with, well, frankly, taking on too much too mm-hmm. soon. Yeah, so the, the struggle is is that we, let's say, hypothetically want to be at a healthy weight. I, I tend to use that just because a lot of people can you know, relate to that. So they're like, okay, I'm not feeling good. I've overweight and I, I want to be at healthy weight. And they want that change. And they, then they get the social media before and after photos and the people magazines and they're the, all the marketing. And they're like, okay, that's what I want. And so without context of, of, of sort of how to get of, first of all, what they actually want and how to get it, they'll oftentimes dive into some sort of diet or quick fix. And it's, it's, it's too much too soon because they're jumping ahead to the physical part of it, which is to change the diet overnight because they want the, the physical body change, but they haven't done the prep mental preparation for that. And and when I said to find out what they really want, I've never met a client that I've ever had that wants to lose the weight and gain it back. They don't want to lose the weight and gain it back. They want to lose weight, but they also want to keep it off. But diets keep their promises in the sense that they might say, do you lose 10 pounds in 21 days if you do what we tell you to do? And th- there's a good chance you'll do that. You'll pay a little bit better attention to food. You're just doing exactly what they tell you, the recipes and the shopping list and the whole thing. But on day 22, you've done no mental prep to say, well, has this, have I incorporated this as a habit? Is this who I am? I've been sort of pretending and trying this out and that's fine. But now what do I do? How do I keep this going? Because they don't want to gain it back. And you know that statistically almost 100% of people gain it back and then some, sometimes even gain back more because then you got the sh- feelings of guilt and shame that you somehow failed. But the model is flawed. It's not a habit change program. It's a diet program. It's not the same thing. So when I'm working with people coaching, I'm like, they'll come to me about food almost every time I'm a nutritionist. And 100% of the times so I go, we'll talk about food later. Because it's not, it's never been about food. It's been about the stress that led them to unhealthy eating, the stress of their lives, the everything else going on. It's like with my parenting book, which is not really a parenting book per se. It doesn't teach people how to parent your kids, but it is saying, however you want to parent your kids, you do that better when you feel good, when your stress is maintained. I want to get people to behave like they want to behave. And the only way to get that done is if you can manage your stress in a way that you're not overwhelmed all the time. Mm -hmm. And so people, when they want to incorporate healthy habits, tend to go to overwhelm. They just go right to the point where they're like, screw it. I'm going to go back to the old ways. I didn't like them, but they were easy. I didn't have to think to be so stressed about it. So that's my main challenge is like, we'll talk about food later when sort of you have a foundation of like knowing exactly who you are, exactly what you want, and you're willing to take the time to make it happen correctly, which is long-term, not a short-term quick fix. Yeah, I love it. You're right, because I think that a lot of these fad diets or crash diets, they're inherently unsustainable, right? Right. You might be able to do it for a few weeks, but there's no way you can carry it on longer. And the people that can, they're just very unusual people. It's very, very tiny percentage of people that can do that. And so then, you know, you might be able to make it through that first phase of a program. But then after that, you're like, I can't live like this the rest of my life. So I might as well do nothing. So it just becomes this sort of all or nothing uh, you know, perfectionistic sort of journey where what you're saying is let's start with small steps <laughs> take it from your program yeah. and integrate it little by little so that it can become part of a natural way that you are. So tell me a little bit more about that. What, how, how do you learn what to start with first? How does somebody learn to integrate these small steps in their habits so that it becomes part of an overall sustainable lifestyle to reach the goals that they would like to reach? Right. Well, I call it the, what my program uses, the core sort of strategy is called awareness-based habit change. Mm -hmm. And the reason I named it that is because every time I work with somebody is the first thing I do is help them establish, and I don't tell people anything. My goal for people is that they're done with me quickly and never need me again. That That is like the ideal. 
There's no fear. There's no, you're going to need me because you can't survive in the world. It's like, no, you absolutely can survive in the world and do it well. But you got to know who you are and you got to know what your goals are. You have to define those very well. I don't do any, any steps, recommendations, or working within people on actual actions until they are super crystal clear about what their ideals would be. Which means if somebody works with me who is, um, you know, doesn't run, hasn't run a day in their lives and they sit on a couch all day in their ideal world that I have, you know, exercises that they sort of go through to get this done. They might write, I run five miles a day and they've never run in their lives. But, but then I can clue in and say, okay, you fashion yourself a runner. You fashion yourself an athlete. You've never run, but that doesn't mean that's not who you actually are. We got to get that person out. I got to find out who that is so that they can come out. Then the small steps ensue, which is, okay, you can't run five miles today because you've never run, but can you walk around your living room for one minute a day? Now, what that does is two things. Most people go one minute a day doesn't do anything. I go, we're not talking about fitness. We're talking about habit. Mm -hmm. Get into the habit of starting to see yourself as somebody who exercises every day. When you walk around for one minute intentionally in your living room, that is exercise. It's not enough to do blood pressure and all the things that are great about exercise, but it's enough to start establishing that habit. Then you can then grow it once it's there and it's existing and you see yourself. I am somebody who exercises every day that can go up extremely fast. The other thing is that people oftentimes interpret my program as everybody starts with that one minute. That's not the case. I've had people who are sick and want to change their diets overnight. And that's their small step. They make a sweeping change because the circumstances of their lives are such that they can do that step and it's not overwhelm. It's all about avoiding that overwhelm. So for some people, I'm like, I'm ready. I've worked with, I worked with a client who had stage four cancer. He's like, tell me what to do. And he overnight, but he did, but he stuck with it because he had the reasons and the motivations to do that. But for other people, literally a stock of celery on their dinner plate. And that's where I've had to start because they have a history of yo-yo dieting, taking on too much and burning out, taking on too much and burning out. And what you said is exactly correct, which is so many people are all or nothing and perfectionists. And I kind of try to lead people into this whole, like, if you want to even talk about perfection, which is kind of weird, but let's talk about living a perfect life. And when you think about that, you're not going to be so beholden to a so-called perfect diet. You're going to maybe take your time in the diet world or the fitness world because you're trying to live the best life in general. So that means you'll do less in certain areas. You won't go all in on a diet because then all the other parts of your life fall away. So you kind of have to balance those things out and learn how to do that effectively. Mm, I love that. Yeah. So it's really important to individualize the coaching, right? So you're saying that some people come in and their mindset is already like, they're already there. They can make these changes because they, they can anchor it into something that's going to be bigger for their lives Correct. rather than, you know, it connected to something external. It's connected more internally for them. And also you're, you're talking about identity, which is right. huge. Have you read that book, The Alter Ego Effect? No. It's such a cool no. book, but it's, okay. it's all about identity. <laughs> identity is so important because when we start seeing ourselves as this person we want to become, it becomes easier to make those changes. It's like such a cool psychological trick that happens in humans. Like, That's well, it. yeah, I am a runner. Instead of people saying like, oh, I'm not a runner. They want yeah. to be a runner, but they're like, no, I'm, I'm not a runner. I can't yeah. run. Once you change into I am a runner, then you're able to make progress easier than whenever you're stuck back in this. I can't do it. You know, you're, you're like stopping yourself. You're your own roadblock, which is just super interesting. Yeah. Well, what kind of, traits do you see in clients? Like whenever you take on a client and, you know, you start learning about them, what kind of traits do you see in people that you're like, yeah, this person's going to be successful? Um, this is going to sound horrible and it's just absolutely true, but I work best with people who have been, they're like in 35 to 65 because they've been through it and they're done. And mm -hmm. so a couple times, and I mean, literally a couple, I've worked with 20 year olds and it's never successful. I'm like, okay, you got to go do like 10 more yo-yo diets because you're not convinced. <laughs> you're not convinced. You still think that that flashy thing over there is going to give you what you want. Okay, fine. Go do that a few more times and then either come to me or somebody who can just, now you can be, and I called, I, I'm very clear about this. It's, it's about being an adult. It's finally giving up that sort of, I did a video on my YouTube channel a while ago called, uh, about Veruca Salt. Remember from Challenge? She's like, mm -hmm. I want it now. I'm like, that's how we are sometimes. And it's like, you got to let that go. And when you can let that go and you have let that go, when you come to me crawling, like, oh, I'm so tired of yo-yo dieting, please. I'm so over it. 
that's my best client. That's mm -hmm. my best client when I'm like, okay, you're done. Good. Let's do this for real now. Let's stop talking about the flashy thing and you telling me that a friend of yours in LA, you know, counts calories and she's thin because that's not what you want. You want to live a good life and you don't want to walk around counting calories every day. So let's have a, let's have an adult conversation and really get clear about what you want, not what I want for you, but what you want. And then we can get moving, actually getting this done for real. And that's my best client every single time is when they're mature enough to have been through all that stuff. And they have their kind of head on straight and they may, may need some help initially, but ultimately they're not going to need help because they're going to understand this very well and be able to move forward without me. Yeah, that's so funny. I mean, why does it take so long? I, I know because I spent probably 30 years of my life yo-yo dieting, but it does take so long before you finally get it. Yep. I mean, it's like you have to fail over and over again. Yep. And then you find like, okay, I guess this isn't going to work. I've yeah. tried it for 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, so. I mean, I've been in the same place like the, <laughs> the, because the marketing on quick fixes, I've done a lot of thinking about this because I'm trying to, at one point I'm like so anti quick fix and I'm moving, you know, all my work is to that, but I'm also trying to figure out the psychology of it. And I think mm -hmm. it's, it's like appealing to this base part of us that just has, it's, the, it's that kid part of us. It's that desire, like we want it so bad. And they're willing in quick fixes to just hit you right where that is. They are willing to say, listen, leave it to us. With no effort at all, we're going to get you there. It's not going to take any work. We're going to, you can just, we'll tell you, do exactly what we tell you. And it just appeals and we're busy. We're raising kids and we're commuting and we're now we've got the coronavirus or there's stress and upon stress. Why wouldn't we want to hand over our power to somebody who, who is just going to do it for us. That's what they're, they're locking into that thing. And just the only unfortunate little hitch is that it doesn't work. And so when we keep getting that, we keep you, you know, I did the same thing, like this is going to work, but everything I've bought in the past, I've bought pills before it's, you still have to remember to take them, you know, and sometimes I'll take Carl Luma or something. I'll read your re Garcinia Cambogia. Okay. Let me give that a try. But then I forget to take it. You know, there's still, there still is a, a way to, you still have to like stick with something long enough to see if it works. Right. And so there's still, a, it is for me always about habit change. You still have to have the tools to establish a habit, whatever that thing is. And so that's the, it's hard. We're, we're living crazy lives. If you look at the human species in the modern world, what we're up against day to day, especially with kids going to schools and everything else, it's, it's, it's crazy. So to think that oh, easily I can lose 10 pounds and keep it off. I think you've got another thing coming. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's super fascinating. And, you know, humans are very interesting and our psychology is sometimes super counterintuitive mm -hmm. because you would think that as a species, we would naturally just follow what feels good mm -hmm. and easily learn what feels good, which we do, but a lot of it's false, right? Like it's faux pleasure, like that's drugs right. and, you know, hypercaloric foods and, <laughs> you know, like sex with random strangers or whatever, you yeah. know, it's like, I'm, I'm you know, you. we, it's this faux pleasure, but we have a really difficult time tuning into authentic pleasure, yeah. which is just the peace and the calm and having yeah. a body that isn't with pain and feeling good and digesting properly. Um, but I think it, you're right. It takes, it takes a few decades before you start valuing that authentic pleasure over yeah. this false pleasure. And That's once right. you get there, you're like, okay, help me. Yeah. Help me learn how to stay there. How do I stay feeling good, a natural good, an authentic good, rather than this hyper chemical, you know, stimulated good, you know, yeah, the, the artificial high of that, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's tough. It is, it is really tough because when you talk, you know, reasonable, like you said, like the simple pleasures, like the real, the sort of deeper underneath the level pleasures, they never, I'll put, I'll put it this way. Like I, I love fruit. So I eat a lot of fruit. So, so I joke around sometimes if I'm training for a race or something, I'll, I'll eat 10 bananas in a day. It's not that much calories. And I, and so I blend them all with water and I put them in a jars and I drink them throughout the day. I don't drink it all at once. And I love it. It tastes great. But I always, I always joke, but it's true. I don't French fry. I love it. You know, yeah. so I love my banana shake, but I don't French fry. I love my banana. That's a whole nother level of love. And we, what we, <laughs> what, what we want is we want the French fry level of love all the time. It's not going to happen, but you won't, but, but, and you don't even want that to happen because it's the side effects of the French fries don't make you feel good. There's other things, right? So we have to, at some point get mature enough to say, this is as good as it needs to get. My banana shake is, I mean, I look, I'll eat French fries on occasion. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying day to day, this banana shake is, is, is fantastic. 
because it doesn't taste as good as the French fries per se, but it delivers me good taste fine, but all the other stuff, which is feeling good in my body and the energy and being happy father and husband and not being in a bad mood and irritable. You know what I mean? Like those things are real. So at some point you're right. It's like, I don't know how long it takes. Maybe there's a study that's like 32 years of doing this before you, do, you know, like somebody will nail it down. It takes exactly 32 years of yo-yo dieting before you're done with it. Um, but you know, at some point you just have to go, I'm done. And I want, I, and I, this is amazing. This is amazing. Like uh, eating this way and being with my family and the things that are really meaningful, deeper relationships that that's as good as it gets. And thank goodness. Cause it's, it's great. It's just not cocaine, you know, yeah. but that's never great. That's just a <laughs> quick thing. And it's, you know, so. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, what do you wish more people knew? Um, I wish people, I wish more people knew could define what true strength is. And that's, it's just something that I'm talking about a lot in my own show. And I've just signed a contract for my next book, which is going to be dealing with the, uh, some of somewhat in, in this subject as well. Um, so I, I guess I just wish people were more defined in, in terms of who they ideally are. And I think that, um, I mean, I quit all social media in 2018 um, because I saw a trend in myself and I, I'll say that the only thing left is I have is YouTube, which people consider social media. I don't per se, but whatever. I don't want to get in that argument, but I turned off all comments on my new videos. Like any video I've done since I came back on YouTube is no comments because I want, I just feel like the social media thing has kind of fomented this idea of being tough and strong, but it's not real. I think Mm -hmm. true strength is compassion. I think it's standing on principle. I think it's, it's, it's necessarily going to be things that are smart and, and doing things that aren't necessarily so pleasurable in the moment, like we were just talking about, but that are better for the world and for the environment. And sort of, it's that line of like the adult brain, the prefrontal cortex making the decisions versus the lizard brain of like fear. And the, notice that in politics, it's so, it's such a and marketing too. fear is the thing mm-hmm. fear sells. That's why I'm not, my program isn't hugely successful. I guarantee it. I think it's a good program, but it's not hugely successful, not by a long shot because I don't market fear. I don't market fear. I market power and strength that not that I have, that you have. And all I'm doing is sort of pushing in the right direction to get to, to where you see it. And then you don't need me anymore. Like I said, but it's not, it's not, it's not effective. Fear is effective. So when people I think would realize that the strength they have and the power they already have is there then it would, I think the world would be a really great place because I think we could all be like, look, it doesn't feel good in the moment, but this is the right thing to do. Like, mm-hmm. like raising my kids. I, and I ain't perfect. I'm not saying that I have my own definite struggles, but just using my kids, like it's hard in a way it's hard to raise them hundred percent plant-based in a very non vegan world, mm-hmm. but I do it on principle. So it doesn't need to feel good in the moment. It feels, it feels good overall. And I'm willing to take the hit on a day here and a day there and use it as a conversation piece with my kids. They're, they're going to have, every kid has struggles. It's not like if they were not vegan, there'd be no problems for my kids ever again. Of course there are, there, like I said, bullying and everything else. So strength is a thing that I'm playing with a lot because I think when people c- clue into how strong each person is individually, then they can start behaving more in line with who I believe most people are, which is at the same, at the very base level, kind and compassion. But when you're marketed fear, man, your, your rationality, and all of a sudden you're, you're reactive instead of active. So yeah, definitely. Well, I think it requires a lot of strength to get off social media and you've been off social media for four years now. Uh, well, t- t- December of 2018. So, you know, no, okay. coming up for coming up for two years. And I, I it was, I was shake. I'm not kidding. I, I was trembling physically when I hit delete on Facebook. I, I, I mean, I, and I didn't just like stop going. I deleted and Instagram deleted. So all the photos, lots of photos gone. I mean, gone. And I was, tr- my hand was, it was like, and I thought this is clearly the right decision for me if I am physically shaking to turn this off. It, it, it's weird. And I started doing much more research in terms of the psychological models on which a lot of social media is built and how they kind of drip out the likes and kind of keep you coming back for more. And it's, it's a very addictive mm-hmm. platform. And I, it just wasn't working for me in my, in my own life. My career definitely took a hit for it. I'll be honest. Like it definitely took a hit. Like I'm, I'm launching Small Steppers. I do not have the reach I had before. And my membership shows it. Um, but I got to say, the last couple of years has been pretty nice. I've been more productive in the last two years than probably in any period of my life. Um, so I think that there's, you know, again, that's the trade-off there. 
is everybody in your family off social media or just you? Just me. My wife is on Facebook only and it's a private group that she's on. So like only her family. So that's all she does on, on social media. And my daughter has, uh, my 16 year old has Instagram and that's it. My twins don't have any social media and that's it. Wow. Um, and we monitored very well. Like the Instagram account is not free for all. It's we approve. We know exactly who her followers are. It's my mom <laughs> and her aunts and uncles and cousins. Like it's very controlled because yeah. I have seen things and I don't want to see them in my family. I'm, it's just not worth it for me. Yeah, I definitely have a love-hate relationship with social media. I think, and you're right, I think when it comes to the career, it's definitely helped me. You know, I've made yeah. some awesome connections and yeah. just met some great people. And especially now in COVID time, I feel like all of my friends are all just my social media friends because I don't see oh, anybody else. I know, I know, but, I get it. But it is, it's so addictive. And I recently took a little camping trip and I was off the grid for five days and I just turned my phone off and didn't even wear a watch. Oh, nice. And I think it was the most peace I felt in so long. You know, the minimalists call it the twitch, that feeling like you always have to be checking your phone. It's like this it weird, like twitch it thing, you know, it and it's so nice not to have, not to be dependent on not not looking, okay, did I post today? Who, who liked it? Well, do I need to share this? And I, st I stopped wanting to walk around and I'd be on a, I, I'm a trail runner, right? So, so I'll be on a, I'd be on a trail run and I would see something beautiful and I wouldn't think, oh, I want to take a picture of that. I would think, oh, would that be good for Instagram? That would be my first thought. It wasn't like, I'm going to experience this. I don't need to take a photo. I, let me just appreciate this in the present. It was always like, oh, is this a good Instagram? I started thinking that way. And I thought, I don't want my brain turn. I just, I don't want to, I don't want to look at the world as if it's Instagrammable or not Instagrammable. I want to, I want to experience the world and then maybe take a picture of it to show my family. But it just it just started changing my brain. I also found there's a great book called Deep Work by Cal Newport. I don't know if you've ever heard of this book. Um, and so when I was writing my second book, Raising Healthy Parents, I began, I signed the deal and I and 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 had a whatever how much time, for six months. I had it kind of laid out, but I had six, six months or so to write it. So I go, okay, I've written a book already. Last time it went pretty well. Let me get cracking. I start writing and like every five minutes. I'm off on YouTube. I'm off on Facebook. I'm off on Twitter. I'm, I, 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 I told my wife, I was like, I'm very concerned. My brain, I can't, I can't stick with something. I, I'm writing for five minutes and then I'm like on YouTube. I don't even know how I got there. And just by chance, one time on YouTube, when I was doing this on the little recommended thing was this Ted talk by a guy named Kyle Newport saying why I don't have any social media. So I click on it 13 minutes. Of course, I'm distracting myself from writing my book, but it was all about this. It was about our, our, human species is shifting, even neurologically speaking, uh, apparently, but shifting away from the ability to stick with something long term to go deep on things where we be, we're becoming more shallow. And like you said, the twitch, like we're clicking around, we're fragmented in everything we do. So I bought that book. And I swear, if I ever meet that guy, he saved that book because I started putting controls. I wouldn't check email except for morning and night. I had a little free plugin on my browser that if I went to YouTube, it would it would cut it off and go get back to work. <laughs> I love I'm not it. Kidding. Yeah, they have them now called site block. It's free. I'm not connected to it. Site block. I do it still. And I started to ease my way into being able to function long term because I started to see the changes in my brain. I did not like them and still don't. And so that was one of the big uh, inspirations for me finally saying, what would it be like if I didn't have social media? I have my podcast. And on my YouTube videos, I have the creative outlet of doing the, both of those things. And, and that's it. I mean, that is literally it. And then, you know, my blog. So it's three yeah. things, but, you know, blog, YouTube, and that's, it's sort of direct. People email me. If they got something to say, they'll send me an email. And, uh, and so it's a more direct connection kind of thing that I really like. Yeah. No, this is such an important topic. And what you're describing is, is just dopamine. So the reason we do that is because it gets hard, right? Like yeah. concentra concentrating on something is hard. It's not necessarily like a pleasant thing to concentrate and have to write. And this happens to me all the time when I write because writing, I already have this like belief that writing is hard for me. Yeah. So I'm writing and I'm like, oh, this is hard. Let me check Instagram. Okay. Let me check uh -huh. my email. Okay. Yes. Let me check LinkedIn. It's like, yeah. I have, I'd like go in this triangle of just checking things. I'm like yeah. an hour later, oh my gosh, I've gotten nothing done. Yeah. And so it is, it's stealing productivity away from us. It's stealing presence though. So even when it comes to, you know, career is one thing, but what about when we're with our families? That's right. I think that's probably the most painful part 
because right. we can't even have a conversation before everybody's starting to look down at their phone and checking things. And I really think you're right that this is going to have a really big impact on humanity. So I hope more and more people start to realize it and start to take measures so that we don't get stuck in this constant loop of social media and being on our phones. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I will say that I went to the extreme of quitting because partly because of what I do mm -hmm. and playing with that whole thing. It's kind of the world I'm in. I'm not anti social media. I'm really not. Uh, what I am, and just like I'm not anti junk food, what I am passionate about is helping people create balance around these things. I had a client one time in North Carolina who had really bad digestion issues. And so she sent me her like the food diary, what she was generally eating. I said, man, your diet's not bad. Five hours a day on Facebook. Whoa. Five hours a day on Facebook fighting with people. Mm. Okay. She's an animal activist, very passionate. And I go, it's great but you're not doing anybody any good because your health is failing because your stress levels are so insane. And so we had to work to break that up. And guess what happened? It helped her freaking digestion. Why? Because it's, you know what stress does to digestion. So it's, it's not just, it's like it's brain stuff, but physical stuff too, as if the brain's not physical, but you know, it's, it's the whole body. It's, it's weakening us when we're in vitriol and a lot of social media, the reason I turn off the comments, most of my comments on my on videos are positive. They're really nice. And, and I love that. But then there's always the the one, the two, you know, that, that, that just for no reason to be mean for no reason. And I don't want to hear it. What I've been talking about recently is there's freedom of speech in this country, but there's also freedom of listening. I don't have to listen to what you have to say. I, I, I have freedom to not hear what you have to say. But what happened in social media is like everybody has an equal voice. Well, it's like, no, you don't. I don't have to listen to your crazy. I don't have to. I can shut that down just like I can plug my ears. And you have the right to say it. Absolutely. And I and I, and I will defend that right. But I also will defend my right to not have to hear it. And so by me creating these controls, I had a little more say in what I was allowing in my life or not. And I think that that was for me the benefit of that. Again, I took it to the extreme. I think some people like my wife finds a very good balance. She stays in touch with like you, stays in touch with family and friends that are close to her. And she's not surfing Facebook all day. So she's found her kind of way to do that. But very easily, especially with kids, you can take, you can go down the rabbit hole and you're on it too much. And it's, and it's breaking it down. And I, I'm seeing that more and more. Wow. Yeah. That's really interesting. Well, tell me what personal habit you're most proud of, how you developed it and how you maintain it. My, my personal habit that I, well, I'll tell you this, uh, this is a good example of my using my own approach. I'm a big, I'm a big, like, I got to set the example because I'm a, I'm a big believer that the example you set is way more important than what you say in, in every regard. And that certainly goes for parenting. So I would find myself at walking in the door at the end of the day and I again, I run a wellness center at a, at a resort and it's great. I love it, but there are stressful days. There's crazy days and I'm like in a thing and I walk in the house and I'm there with my kids and my wife, but I'm not there with my kids and my wife. Mm -hmm. So I got the phone and I'm doing the email, especially during this, this is the social media days, right? So I'm checking the thing and, I'm there, and they're there and I haven't seen them all day, but there I am and I'm irritable. Dad, mm -hmm. can you, hold on a second. I get, you know, and I'm in that place mm -hmm. and I still am once in a while. However, I realized in the writing of that, of my Raising Healthy Parents book that I didn't have to beat myself up about that. I could just say, you know what, that's not the father that I really am. Not, not a, I'm not a bad father. I'm just not being the father that I want to be, that I believe I am. And I knew, and so I started to say like, okay, who am I really? Well, I defined, even though I wasn't doing it, I was very clear. So I'm the guy who walks in the door and puts his phone down and is actually with his kids and with his wife. I'm with my family. That, that's who I am. And then it was a question of, okay, no beating myself up. How do I get there? So I had to look and say, what are the circumstances? Well, I've got a stressful job, so that's one. But what am I doing on the way home? Well, I'm listening to the news. Oh, that's going to be great. <laughs> you know, like it's never good news, right? Because that doesn't it hit, hit us. You know, like you, you, you've seen the things. They, they title things negatively. They manipulate those things because we click on negative more than we click on positive. So I stopped listening to the news. I would only listen to music or like fun podcasts. Then I even went a step further and said, you know what? What if I just don't listen to anything? What if I just get in my car in solitude and quiet and pull in my driveway? Then before I get out of my car, I take about five deep breaths. And for the first couple of times, my wife would be like, you know, she, cause she lives, she works in the studio downstairs and she'd come up and she'd be looking at the window. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, hold on a second. <laughs> take five deep breaths, which is like 30 seconds or whatever, a minute. And then I walk in the house and guess who I am? the guy I want to be, not the guy that's irritable and weird. So it was a habit that I, and it, again, I have blips. There's no, I'm not going to say that's not perfection, but 
But more often than not, I walk in the door and I put my phone on the counter and I am there. And I'm, you know, when we're making dinner together and we're chatting and we're talking to the kids and it's like a whole nother world. So I would say that ultimately, because family is to me the, the number one thing, that's mm-hmm. my proudest moment of being more me than not me um, mm-hmm. most days. That is my, that's my best habit, I would say. I love how you have so much insight that you were able to you know, identify the problem and problem solve and try to find a solution for it. I've actually heard of this before, this transitioning problem that we have as people, you know, transitioning from work to home, home to some other activity. And Brendan Burchard actually talks about this in one of his books and how you can develop a routine so that you can transition from one activity to another and bring your best self into your next activity. But they also talk about it in the alter ego effect. So I really think you should read that book. I I, I wrote it. I wrote it down. You're going to love that one. Um, (laughs) So that's great. I love that. That's beautiful. And now you're able to just be more mindful of like, okay, am I being the dad I want to be right now? Or am I being the the dad that's over-focused on, you know, an hour ago when I was still at work and doing all of that stuff? That's beautiful. Well, Sid, this has been a great conversation. I would love for you to tell my listeners how they can connect with you and a little bit more about the services and products you offer. I know you have a couple of books, another one on the way. Tell us a little bit about this 50K too, because that sounds crazy. Okay. Well, um, the best places, since I'm not on social media per se, is uh, SidGarzaHillman.com. That's my website. My blog's there. You can actually watch my videos there too, but you can go to YouTube. Um, And then SmallSteppers.com, which is my 12-week online program. I've got a... You know, I don't know when this is going to air, but I've got a relaunch where I redesigned everything and that's happening on September 7th. Um, so I'm, if anybody listens and gets on it, great. If not, it'll become a thing where it's evergreen and you can sign up at any given time. Right now I'm doing a group launch on that. But anyway, smallsteppers.com, you can find out all the info either way. Um, my books are Approaching the Natural, a Health Manifesto and Raising Healthy Parents, Small Steps, Less Stress and a Thriving Family. And like I said, I got a new one on the way. It'll be, um, it's slated for release in, in uh, spring of 2021. So I've, I've written it in a draft. I got to get through the editing process and the designing process. So it's sort of just, just that just, just started happening. So anyways, um, and I run the wellness center at the Stanford Inn eco resort that's stanfordin.com. And that's the only plant-based resort in North America. So that's pretty cool. And my race is called the Mendocino coast 50 K it's a trail ultra marathon that's sold out every year. It's one of only two, all hundred percent plant-based, uh, ultras in, in you, in the U S and probably only one of about five in the world. I don't really talk about that. It's not on the website or anything. It just happens to be, I would say probably 95% of my runners aren't vegan or vegetarian, but it's just what that is. It's my own ethic. So that's how I'm rolling on that. Um, and it's beautiful. It's just this big 34 mile, it's a 50 K, but I go a little bit more, but anyway, 34 mile loop on trails, about 5,000 feet of elevation. And, um, it's excellent. This was the five fifth year was going to be April of this year. And of course I had to cancel it. So I kicked it to next year. Um, but this year's race sold out in 25 minutes and I had a hundred people on a wait list within two hours. It was in, insane. And I've done literally zero promotion. And so, um, and no social media on that. So that, that's a, that's how I wish all the parts of my life were because I've done no promotion and no social media and still sell the race out. But everything else I do, I, I have to struggle. So it's, I'll take what I can get anyways. And so, uh, so it's pretty cool. That's MendocinoUltra.com if you want, if anyone wants to find out about that. Well, I think it's because ultra marathoners are kind of crazy though, right? I mean, like, it's totally. like they're just like, where's yeah. my next it's ultra going to be? And, <laughs> and it's, and it's very word of mouth. Like they're all like, oh my gosh. And they come in big groups, you know? And so, yeah, totally. They're, and that's why I love the ultra marathon world. I've run about seven myself and um, they're ragtag. Like they still show up in like non-branded shirt. You know, like everyone's wearing like used clothes, you know, like it's, it's kind of this under the radar thing, especially my race is not a marquee race. And so it's very familial and the resort where I work caters it. So I feed everybody, not, not just the runners. Like if you show up to watch the race, you can eat. And so it just, is kind of this really fun party and I have a lot of returners and it's really intimate and I keep the number at 150 and don't go more people go, you should grow it. I go, no, 150. And it's very manageable and fun and cool. So it's, 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 I was very bummed that I couldn't yeah. do the race this year because yeah. I look forward to it socially. Like it's just, I see the same kind of it's same like a big faces reunion, you know, it's, it's so, so fun. fun. It's so fun. And I was so bummed. And so anyway, but hopefully well, that sounds year, super fun. Well, I think what I'm going to do, tell me how this sounds. Okay. I'm going to book a stay at the Stanford Inn because I've been okay. wanting to go there. It looks amazing. It's pretty great. 
and I'm going to volunteer at the race. Oh my so God, then I can totally go to the that. Stanford Inn and volunteer because there's no way I'm going to run 34 miles with 5,000 feet of elevation. So I will volunteer. That way I can awesome. stay a part of it and Heck stay yeah. at the Stanford Inn. And, we can and then we can hang out in person. person. So, we can actually hang out in person. Um, that would be great. I would love to have you. Uh, April 17th is the, sl- is the tentative date. State parks won't even take an application for permits, but they have me marked down as tentatively april 21st april 17th of 2021 All that'd right, be so well, fun i would love to meet where are you where are you physically i'm in yakima washington so i'm not uh, okay. too far got it got but it. fingers crossed that we'll have this covid thing kicked by then i hope oh, i know but okay awesome so all kinds of cool things you have going on definitely check out his small steppers program and the books and i'm looking forward to your new book coming out so before i let you go please leave my listeners with one call to action. What is one thing that they can do to improve their lives starting right now? Right. Take, take five minutes and write down if you were living your ideal life right now, what would it look like? That's the number one. And no no pressure to get there. What would, what would it be ideally? Because we oftentimes define ourselves by what we're doing. Like I could have said, I'm a bad father because I walk in the door and I'm irritable, but I'm not a bad father. That's I, I'm in conflict because that's not who I am. I'm not that guy. So how do I become my, the guy? Well, I had to define that for me. What is what is my ideal parent, parenting set look like? What do I look like as an ideal father? Get that down. Know who you are. Know what you stand for. Then you have a good chance of getting there because you know exactly what direction you're moving and you're less able, less willing and, and able to get distracted by flashy quick fixes. You were like, no, this is where I'm going and I want to get there for real. Mm-hmm. So that would be my number one. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. I love it. Okay. Take five minutes and write down what it would be like to live your ideal life. Sit with that, visualize it, and then you're more able to take the steps to get there. That's right. Well, Sid, you are such an inspiration. Thank you so much for this conversation. I've learned so much and taken a lot from, from our talk today. So keep up the great work. And I hope that you have a very fantastic day. Thanks. And you too. It's great. So much fun to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.